Hello and welcome to another edition of the Canadian Premier League Newsroom Podcast. My name is Christian Jack and I'm here with my content team looking back at all the matches again from midweek July 20, 21 and 22. Results this week, FC Edmonton 1, Halifax Wanderers 0. Easton Ongaro finally gets his first goal of the season after 377 minutes to start the year without one. Pacific FC 4, Atletico Ottawa 2. This was fun and we'll get into this in detail you could make the case it has been the game of the season so far. And on Thursday night, Cavalry FC 2, Forge 1, a clash of the two Titanic cl- teams in the uh, Canadian Premier League and Cavalry come out on top in that one. If you missed it, please join me and Marco Bustos as he shared some tremendous stories on Beyond the Pitch in the podcast this week. I hope you find some time to listen to that. Uh, team, good morning here on Friday. Uh, what was your favorite anecdote from the Marco Bustos show? Uh, Marty, let's start with you. Good morning. Uh, this this maybe doesn't count as an anecdote, but uh, when you asked when you asked him which stadium you ever want to play in or, or, or score a goal, and he said BC Place, mm. that just got me so amped for the Canadian Championship, and I'm going to need him to score. I know that I know their tie isn't uh, isn't at BC Place, but I'm going to need him to score against the Whitecaps. That would be amazing. Yeah, that was really for narrative. It was really interesting how you mentioned that. He's, he's clearly <laughs> yeah. got some things that he wants to make sure that he can get, he can uh, go back and do. Uh, Charlie O'Connor Clark, morning. What was your your take? Uh, uh, my favorite anecdote definitely has to be Pamadu Ka betting him two hundred bucks. He couldn't beat him in the beep test. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one for sure. Uh, Brady Reed, good morning. You, what do you like about it? Yeah, I liked the, when you asked him about his journey back to Canada to play in the Canadian Premier League, and he mentioned he was on a one-month subscription with a One Soccer, and he, he watched the first Valor game, and he was like, I'd like to be a part of that. And then he went on to score eight goals that year, so that, I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, <laughs> That was fascinating, too. Just goes to show you the players really care about how media you know, is, is, is treating this league. Uh, Benedict Rogue, uh, last but not least, good morning. Your favorite part of the show? Yeah, I like the anecdote of uh, going to train with Liverpool and, and Chris Mavinga and Raheem Sterling and, and kind of see what all that was about. Yeah, that was fun as well. Really interesting. A great, great discussion. I can't thank Pacific FC and Marco himself enough for opening up his mind and his heart to talk about that. And as I said, if you haven't listened to it, we would encourage you to do so uh, on this very station. All right, let's get into the games of the week. Let's start with Thursday night's defeat of Forge by Cavalry FC. Anthony Novak uh, gets a goal. Well, a really good goal for him. Uh, And Ali Musi obviously gets a goal as well. Two first half goals. It was a very comfortable 45 minutes. I was a correspondent on this game for the side watching this. I know you guys all watched it pretty closely as well. Um, Marty, you were there. What were your overall impressions of this one? And, uh, you know, we'll get to Forge in a minute, but the, the headline here is, is Cavalry and how good they were, isn't it? Anthony Novak scores, looking for a celebration, and we didn't get one. Not against his former team. That, that was the story for me. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's a tale of, of two teams here. Like Cavalry, you, you can't deny how quality they were. Um, you mentioned how how dominant that first half was, and I know you want to talk about how they changed shapes seemingly constantly throughout that match, countless times. Um, and and you know, interestingly, moving to that back four at halftime, and then and then the many other changes after. But I think this is also a story about Forge FC, who you know, frankly, as we could tell on the ground, they've run out of gas. You know, they run out of gas at the end of this. You know, Bobby didn't mince words at the end of uh, at the end of their uh, at the end of the game. They're flying out today out of Winnipeg here. Um, you know, the, without the with the injuries and the players that have been, you know, as as Smear, you know, has pointed out, that have played full ninety minutes in a lot of these games. You know, Dom Samuel didn't have the best game for Forge yesterday, um, but he was. He was arguably their, one of their better defenders, one of their best defenders throughout this entire uh, season so far. I think it's just ultimately a tale of two teams. Forge just didn't really have the fitness to match. They didn't have the fitness, but they didn't have the mindset either. I think that's that too, pretty, yeah. pretty honest as well. I think they, you know, afterwards, many owners said we just weren't good enough in the first forty-five minutes. We needed to be, we needed to be quicker. We needed to be ready and up for it. Then cavalry, I think. Well, I don't think I know that it is in their mind often how Forge come out on top against them. And they obviously at six games, ending a six game winless run against them. And they did come out. You know, there was a moment in the first five minutes where David Norman Jr. just goes straight through on a tackle. And I loved it because it was like it, it set the tone right away. Legua did one later. Escalante won that big battle on the right against Matusla that led to the Novak goal as well. Um, look, we can get into tactics, and I thought, and I thought that they were brilliant in terms of their adaptability and intelligent on the fly, uh, Charlie. But all, ultimately, this was a team with real serious intent, whistle to whistle, to get the three points. Absolutely, you would kind of see a difference in how these teams came into this game. 
uh, cavalry in in past games against Forge. I mean, for for lack of a more elegant metaphor, they've been punched in the face by this team mm. several times now, um, and I, I don't think they've beaten them since that Canadian Championship tie. Or maybe there might have been one of those games at the end of 2019 where nobody was really trying that hard because they already booked their places in the final. But cavalry really, really, really wanted to get one over on this team a lot more than than maybe than. Then Forge felt they needed to get the three points today or, in, or last night, I guess it was. And Cavalry's performance in this game, it actually did remind me a little bit of the game before this as well, where they just started to look more like themselves. They come in, they're pressing a little bit higher. They're they're kind of playing with that that sort of intensity in midfield. They'll slide through guys. They're going to win the ball off you. I mean, I don't think Nick Ledgerwood is ever having more fun on the pitch than when he's just using his body to, to just hit guys off the ball and win it and then play it forward as quickly as he can. And they play quite direct in that sense. And Joe DiChiara as well. I mean, what an addition he is to that kind of team because he's maybe the perfect kind of player for that style. And yeah, Cavalry just looked, you know, again, they looked a lot like the best versions of Cavalry we've seen in the CPL, maybe with more actual quality on the pitch than ever, but with that same sort of mindset where they're going to try and beat you up a little bit. And they really did, and they just played with pace, and they played direct, and they, they, they got the job done very well. Yeah, that's a really good point. They, we know what the culture is there, right? We know the mindset. We know their identity before they step on the pitch. And then it seemingly look, it feels like they've got a little bit smarter. They've got some more wiser players in there, and we know they've got younger and they're quicker, and they mm-hmm. play quicker, they can go through, and they didn't really, you know, Tommy Wilden Jr. said after the game, we didn't really need the ball as much, you know. I think his phrase, Marty, was we let them get drunk on possession, which is, which is, which is a great phrase. We've had some great quotes so far, but get, letting Forge get drunk on possession was a good one. Um, <laughs> it was hard to single out individuals. I did the analysis piece for the site. I singled out DiChiara because I thought he was tremendous again in midfield, and also Dan Klomp. And uh, I can guarantee you this man's going to be in the Gatorade team of the week. We're already putting it out there because th- this was arguably an, in a week where unfortunately we lost Andrew John Baptiste to injury for the season. Uh, Benedict, this was arguably one of the finest individual center back par- uh, performances we've seen in a very long time from the young Dutchman. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think he was, he was all over the place defensively, um, offensively as well. He, he, we've seen his passing ability the whole season so far and, and that was definitely on, on display. And also, ability to run with the ball a couple of times later in the game. He was, he was beating guys on the dribble. And, and he, overall, he was brilliant from start to finish. He was brilliant. Brady, what about Forge then? Marty touched on it there. He'll know more than anybody about just how this bubble life is just really fatiguing everybody. They get to fly home. The, you, the, I spoke to Maxim Tiso after the game. Bobby Smino just they couldn't have a, help but put a smile on the face. Everybody's just relieving themselves the pressure to get home and see their loved ones now. Um it has been a real difficult time for them there, though. Four wins, four losses. They've been behind 199 minutes already this season. That is more than they were ever last season at all in 2020. They've already been behind four times uh, in the first half of games as well. I mean, this has just been an interesting campaign for them, although they have won four games and at times, Brady, shown real signs of being the better team than everybody else during this little mini tournament here. Yeah, I think that's one of the things is, you know, it, it, yes, they're 500, but considering they didn't draw a game, 12 points is actually really not that bad of a showing considering the way we're talking about this team. But that's more about the standards that, that they've kind of, we're, we're grown accustomed to with this team in the past two seasons. But yeah, it was certainly ups and downs. It was obviously a really shaky start. And then they, they changed the formation a little bit. And part of that was, was through injuries and that sort of thing. But I'm not sure if it was you, Christian, or Charlie, but somebody mentioned a few weeks back about, how that, that back three, that fluidity, almost it almost really brought the best out of them. And I think last night was even further a testament to that because they looked a little bit lost. And I think part of the reason Cavalry were winning all those battles was they just had such a good understanding of, of, of what their jobs were on the field and Forge were kind of adjusting on the fly after after having played that back three for a few more games. So I think that was advantage wielding with the with the way he had his team set up and and for like you said for Bobby and them it's a difficult result they almost stole one at the end believe it or not because it really wasn't a two to one game right but that's that's just how good they are but I think once you see them back at Tim Hortons Field they'll be a much more organized and focused team. I should correct myself, third time, not the fourth time, that they've been down 2-0 in their history. Uh, Joe DiChiara will be involved in twice of those, by the way, one time with York and then this one as well. Um, final word on Cavalry. It appeared that they've been through the ups and downs of bubble life as well. Charlie, I know you've done a ton of these games. Again, Tommy said last night that 
They even went through a period where, uncharacteristically for them, they earned four games without a goal. They knew those mm-hmm. moments would come. We haven't even seen any, hardly anything of Joe Mason yet. Uh, but, you know, a, a team here that comes out the bubble with four wins, two draws, two losses on a real high, get to go home now, although is playing, let's be honest, what is developing into being the harder side of the schedule with a lot of games out west against some of the best teams. This yep. is a team that I think will p- feel pretty comfortable where they are, Charlie. Yeah, I think Cavalry will be very happy coming out of this bubble because I think you certainly certainly they've had you know ups and downs, and I think their highs have been higher than their lows have been low in this in this bubble. If that makes sense, I mean they had that that slump which was very frustrating for them, but I think they still drew one or maybe even two of those games uh, nil nil because uh, they, they their defensive solidity has been great. I mean, as you mentioned Dan Klomp and, and Mason Trafford and. Karifa Yao, they're a very hard team to break down, even when they do just let the other team have the ball and, and you know, knock it around a little bit in the middle third. Cavalry's fine with that. They know that they'll eventually pick something off and they can launch a counterattack. Um, and I think I think they are very happy with this. I think of the top four teams from last year, Cavalry's probably the most different in terms of the personnel. The Halifax maybe is a little bit different, but no, even still. Um Cavalry's got a lot of new faces in that squad. They've got a lot of players that are still trying to get adapted to, you know, a culture that's very specific and very, you know, well ingrained in this team. And, and they're all buying in very quickly. And I think, I think really there's not a lot for Tommy Wheeldon Jr. to complain about because guys are doing their jobs. They're, they're, you know, accepting these, these different kinds of roles in different parts of the pitch very very openly and very happily, and and most players are doing very well. And there's also there's a lot of players on this team that have done well enough, but we know have the quality to be even better. I mean, Mo Farsi, for instance, is a phenomenal player that has played well, but maybe not hit the heights of 2020 yet. Mm-hmm. And I think those are things that we will start to see as this team continues to get more and more comfortable. And and I think I think Cavalry will be you know yeah pretty satisfied with what they've seen so far. Next up for these teams, clashes on Friday night. They head home out of the bubble to go again on, on their travels. Forge go to York, 7 o'clock match there on the come on match of the week on Friday the 30th. And Cavalry go to the Vancouver Island. Uh, they go to Vancouver Island to play on Pacific FC, 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific in that game as well. Um, Marty, I get the feeling that there's a lot of cheering going on in the halls. T- tell me, I'm, don't tell me I'm wrong because I just want this to be real. I have a feeling as these teams get out of their hotels this morning, they're like five-year-olds running to a birthday party or something. There have been there have been a couple of smiles exchanged in the hallways the last couple of days, and I can tell you that those are smiles you weren't getting about a week ago. Right. I'll, I'll go I'll go that far. No, I mean, and and you know, I was just chat just chatting quickly with Bobby and Tommy as they're leaving. You know, it's right out the door, ready to go. Like I think it's it's a lot. I think Bobby touched on this at the post game press conference. It's a lot more than just you know getting out of the bubble. It's more about trying to like you know. I think it's very difficult to imagine playing a game at home in front of fans right now. That's what, you know, my impression is from from players and, and, and coaches. It just seems almost surreal. So it's just more about that sort of excitement and that giddiness to, to properly return to what the league is, you know, uh, for the most part, um, is what's really exciting people. And, of course, getting able to see your family. That too. Yeah, no, no doubt. Can't wait well, for that. Yeah, that's just I mean, I, this. The, honestly, quite honestly, on a serious note, the sacrifices that these players, these teams, these staff members of these league, Marty, you're one of them, have put in together over the last the last month for other people to enjoy this league is quite frankly staggering, overwhelming, and uh, we all sen- sincerely appreciate it. It will get harder though for Forge; they have to take on Concacaf in the Concacaf League twice with matches in El Salvador. Check our website campl.ca for the news on that that came out on Friday as well in the restrictions about what will be difficult for them now uh in their in their quest uh for a long concacaf run um pacific four ottawa two this was a gift <laughs> to everybody we've all been there we've all sat through some difficult halves we love this league we've watched as a team every game every minute every second and sometimes boys the nature of sport it has been tough nothing tough about this one an absolute gift a gem of a match for us and for anybody that watched it charlie you're our correspondent on this i'll get all your deep dives on this in a second but i know everybody else watched it benedict with watching this game with a true smile on your face i'm sure i know you're up early and we'll get to the reasons why you're up early earlier with the can team uh but i'm pretty sure that you stayed awake during this match yeah i think you'll actually find i, I didn't <laughs> um, 
Uh, <laughs> I fell asleep. Did you right fall asleep after the, uh, after, after right Malcolm Shaw's goal. two goals? You right fell asleep. Yeah. It's two 0 Yeah, and then I missed the red card. Missed the hat trick. Woke up. It was three two. I couldn't um, have set it up better than this. I could not say. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I had no idea. Sorry. So you were up for the Olympics. You actually yeah. watched the game, you, and you sat through some. Let's be honest, some dreary, really, really poor games. And then, so you watched, and you get to two 0 and then you, so you fall asleep as the goal as a two 0 with Shaw. Is that right? Un- un- unintentionally, I, sh- I should add as well. Oh, I, 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 I didn't choose to fall asleep. No, no, I, I agree. <laughs> I can, I can you know, your commitment to the cause is there. Uh, so then it's two 0 and you're dreaming as the red cards going on, and so you wake up when uh, it's three two, and as maybe like five minutes before Terry Campbell scored. Did you stay awake for Campbell? Or did you just do one I, of these turn off and go to sleep? I, I, I didn't see a Campbell goal. <laughs> Amazing. Did you make it to the end or did you just go right back to sleep? I, I didn't make it, didn't make it to the end of that game. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's so, oh, that's so interesting. So in your mind, Ottawa won 2-1. Basically, is that what you're telling us? <laughs> yes. With the goals that you saw. Well, everybody else got to see an absolute stun- stunning game. Uh, Brady, what was your take? This was late for you, mate. Were you awake for this one? Because I know you were working on the early game as well. Yeah, no, I, I was. It, it, we say a, tool to, a tale of two halves, sorry, sometimes, but this was like a tale of the first quarter where Ottawa's press was just fierce and they were all over them. And then McKendry just went full, uh, like, Gabriel Jesus in the Copa America, and, and he was <laughs> off. And then <laughs> it was yeah. a complete – by the way, like, I just want to ask quickly around the table. I know Ollie Platt said he didn't think he thought that was a harsh red. I'm just curious if anybody agrees with him, or do we all think that that was a red? Uh, I, I love Ollie, but I can't agree with him. I understand his rationale. I understand mm-hmm. everything that he's saying. But for me, 99 out of 100 times, that's a red card. It's, it, it, you just yeah, that's you a can't red. do that. It's It's a – you know what you're getting into when you put. And your by the way, there was, I understand what he's saying, but it, yeah, uh, and, yeah, and McKendry knew he, he didn't mean any he knew harm. Right away. But yeah. like, it's just the, the nature of the, how high the boot was, and into the yeah, he just, very like, reckless. Yeah, yeah, and in danger. I of think this yeah. the, uh, the this is like the you know, international sign for I'm guilty, and I just did something bad. Then that's yeah. what we see from McKendry. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's un- it's unfortunate because they actually really did start very well. But I I think you can make the case that Pacific could be the worst team to go down to ten men against just because they move the ball so quickly. We were talking about this yesterday before the Forge Cavalry game. They had attempted like almost a thousand more passes than any other team in the league, and so. You've got players like, you know, Bustos and Chong who've now got even more space to operate and, and you know, show that fluidity and combine. It's going to be really difficult. It's going to be a long night. I think that that's obviously what we've seen in the end. And Charlie? it was 91% possession for, or uh, not Pass, possession, sorry, uh, passing uh, yeah. accuracy. Is that Was that a record, Charlie? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I checked with our friends at, at CPL Data. And they confirmed that that is a record, but it's also a record for the fewest percentage of their passes played forwards. Mm. I think it was like 20, uh. 23 or something percent. Um, so they we'll, we'll, we'll get into this in a sec. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pacific <laughs> moved the ball a lot, but at start, maybe not necessarily forwards. They did. Now, covering these games as correspondents, we all love it. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, the nature of the business is sometimes you start writing a few match reports as the game goes on. Charlie, how many times did you delete and restart your, <laughs> your match report in this game? Because <laughs> this was Several. fun. Yeah. I, I <laughs> take, take, know, us, take us through your evening and watch it, w- w- watching the observations of this one. I know for sure I went through four titles mm-hmm. for the recap because I think I think I, I, I saw, you know, Ottawa goes up 2-0. I'm like, Awesome. I'm going to be done by halftime. <laughs> right, re- <laughs> recap, you know, Shaw Brace lifts uh, lifts Ottawa over Pacific or, or whatever. Yeah. But really, like, the first 15 minutes of this game, it, it wasn't just the Ottawa went up 2-0. They just looked like a completely different team to what we've seen from Ottawa in the past. You know, and, and they even, well, I mean, certainly Mista didn't say it after the match because we didn't get to talk to him for... Uh, you know, red card reasons, but uh, uh, Malcolm Shaw and, you know, assistant coach slash former CPL player, Ajay Cabra, after the match, were kind of talking about how they went into this game deciding they were going to try out a high press. They were going to play with kind of a, a front three that would run at those, uh, at those center backs and the full backs and kind of try to pin them back. And it absolutely worked mm. in the first 20 yep. minutes. And I think it actually is kind of a shame that we didn't get to see more of it. Because obviously, when when uh, when Ben McKendry, one of your you know most important midfielders, gets sent off 
22 minutes into the game, you kind of can't really do that, especially against a team that will notice that space when you try and press, and they'll just play the ball through really quickly, and then you're done, you're toast. <laughs> but it might yeah. be the worst team to lose a man to in the in the league. Yeah, I, I think yeah. so. I think it is because Pacific, the way they kind of explained it, they didn't say that they changed anything in particular after they went up a man. But it was more like, and, and James Merriman, again, neither team had their head coach on the bench by the end of this. So I don't know how. Uh, how There's a know, great moment in the broadcast, that... Charlie. Sorry, there's a great <laughs> moment where they showed the sweets. Yeah. The one right next to the other. And it was just like, it was, it was a great, it was, it was like two guys playing PlayStation trying to figure out from the distance <laughs> uh, how to move guys around. Like it was, it was fun. Yeah. I, I don't know what it would be like to be, you know, like Pamaduka watching that game from way up on high and not being able to really uh, affect the game much. But yeah, it. I think the way Pacific saw it, they still felt okay after those first 15, 20 minutes. I think they would still have had, you know, a lot of the ball because, you know, they got scored on by giving it away and you have to have it to give it away, of course. But they kind of saw that they weren't necessarily moving it very quickly. They, I think they kind of ended up seeing out the first half with that same sort of, they had a few little probing moments. They win a penalty from one of them, from just kind of Marco Bustos making his run as he often does his little cut in from the right. Um, and then in the second half, they're just like, okay, you know what? We are just going to absolutely explode and we're going to move the ball extremely quickly. We're going to, you know, try to make all these passes as a lot more of them forwards and they, I think they had like, like over seventy percent of possession in the second half because Ottawa just, you know, bunkers in this four-four-one kind of formation, and there's not really a lot that they can do otherwise against a team that's coming on as hard as Pacific is, and it uh, didn't really work for Ottawa. But I'm not sure I would necessarily have expected it to <laughs> against this team, right? Because Pacific really did. I, I mean, when they were down two-one you're kind of like, all right, I maybe it's possible. Sometimes when you see a team go down to 10 men, you just see them completely, especially when they're up a goal or two, they completely just have absolutely no interest in the ball. You just see them completely like sit on their own, you know, 18 yard line or something. And they like the, the ball will come to them and they just put their foot through it. It's gone. And that's kind of kind of how the rest of the game plays out. And it's really boring. Mm. But once we saw Pacific break through that once, in the, in the second half, they tie the game. I'm like, yeah, this might get uh, kind of ugly, actually, <laughs> because they really just were. I mean, Alejandro Diaz scored a, a hat trick, which, you know, we've kind of been waiting on for a while. I just got to feel really good. Yeah, second mm-hmm. one ever in the league. Shout out to Rodrigo Gattas mm-hmm. for the first one. That was a great game. That 6 2 York win. But uh, yeah, shout out to Alejandro Diaz for that, that fantastic, you know, just being in the right places at the right time for guys to find him on the, the corner kick from Marco Bustos. He's just, it sounds like that's a routine they've worked on a lot. Just that sort of outswinger from Bustos right onto his head. Great. I don't know where the markers were, but <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great ball, a great finish. And then the next one, again, you know, I think it was Bustos again with the shot. And then Diaz is just quicker and, and you know, sees the rebound a lot faster than any of the defenders. And that's kind of the things that set apart a great, a great goal scorer. I mean, Maybe I don't know if poacher is the word because sometimes people don't like that, but I don't think it's a I don't think that's a knock on anybody to say that a, a player is a poacher and can you know get on the ball there and, and find those spots. So yeah, Diaz is great. Bustos was great again. Maybe in a different sort of role, he's a little bit more creative in this one, a little bit more reserved in how he personally was attacking the goal. He was kind of looking for teammates a little bit more often um, after a couple frustrating games for him, and that really seemed to work. But yeah, Pacific just kind of took control and they, you know, sort of flipped a switch. Yeah, great performance by them. Uh, talk about poachers. We're going to get to a game in a second with Brady where two teams would love poachers mm-hmm. right now. So yeah, absolutely no problem uh, with poachers. Uh, we thank Pacific FC in particular for a really entertaining game. Hey, and in the world of Benedict, congrats to Ottawa for a terrific 2-1 win. Uh, FC Edmonton <laughs> won, Halifax nil. Brady, you're our correspondent in this one. This did not deliver like the other one. Uh, one of, maybe one of the reasons why Benedict fell asleep. I'm not sure if he was watching this one, but uh, maybe he could have had a nap earlier because for a 
quite a long time. Let's be honest, it was pretty dour. But in the end, the most important thing was a team who needed it found a way to win. A team who didn't need it, who definitely needed it as well, did not. And that is Halifax. We'll get to in a second. But I alluded to it off the top. Fraser Ed comes on, plays a higher role, wins the big ball, wins the ball with a high press, and Easton Ongaro with an unmissable shot. Let's be honest, that's hope poked in with his left foot into the open net finally delivers and this was a big moment Brady for Easton as he spoke to you after the game as well yeah massive home and honestly it wasn't really his night before that he he had a pretty good shout for a penalty about 10 or 15 minutes before he did score and then missed a very good chance on the volley earlier in in, in first half and so they, they don't matter when you get that one at the end of the game and I think he kind of said that it was it was a long time coming and he mentioned you know patience of, of Alan Koch and, and his teammates was a big part of how he was able to keep his, his mind in the right spot but no you mentioned Fraser Ayer there like he said afterwards he wants to start every game and I think after that performance it's going to be difficult to, to leave him out right I mean the free kick he, he almost scored it on his own terms with that free kick he Oxner was beat that was in for sure other than the the crossbar and then it's one thing to pass it to Wangaro, like, but that wasn't just you know like a random play. He he's pressed way up the pitch. You mentioned he's he's higher up. He shows that energy off the bench and just the definition of an impact sub. Wins it off of, of off of Sal, who's a little bit naive. He's playing a, a lot of minutes at center back right now, just through injuries. And most people could shoot in that situation, but he sees Wangaro open. That's a guy who really needs a goal, and and he delivers. And from there, Edmonton solid defensively. It was only ten minutes, but they. They, they were full marks for, for three points in the end. Well, that has become their identity. We have to give Alan Koch and FC Edmonton some love here because they started the season off with really playing fullbacks out wide. You mentioned why Ed's not playing. They've brought the system in place and then they've really started to just express themselves a little bit more, more, more having like having, having Showman Gardner play wide, having players that can deliver a creativity. Um, I was doing some research on, on this team earlier. First halves through seven games this season, they've lost 3-0. Second halves, they've won 6-3. All their goals have come in second halves, and they get stronger. They look fitter now as well. Um, and Alan Koch seemed pretty positive after this one, Brady, and he should be. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you raise a good point. There's, there shouldn't be, like, a negative. We mentioned the poacher mentality, but even these these two blocks of four that are tough to break down, like, if, if you've done the work to, to get your, your team to buy into that and, and keep yourself in games late and find, like, goals, like, if it's sustainable, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. And, you know, Mazout Mert meant, as well just you know like yes Halifax had 60 percent of possession in this game but it was really it was largely from the perimeter you know they didn't they didn't have a lot of runners in behind the midfield wasn't particularly involved in the final third he said a little bit yes okay we we could have done more to combat that but full kudos to to Alan Koch as you mentioned he he was thrilled with it like he said it's he, they've instilled a mentality in this team that maybe didn't exist last year that we're gonna de- we're gonna defend for each other and we're gonna give ourselves an opportunity to stay in games and the results haven't yet really come up top but when you do have Warshevsky and Ankaro you've got to fancy your chances to to find one every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, they're fun to watch. Uh, watch Jesse came off injured. We'll keep an eye on that. But he has been a really, really bright spot for that team to watch. As on the uh, as for Halifax on the other side, Marty, um, this is concerning, is it not? I mean, they still only scored two in two two of the seven goals. They are playing again this weekend. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, this basically just looks like a team dying to get out the bubble and kickstart their season that hasn't gone the way that they they, they would have hoped. Yeah, this is a good chance to reset, right? We you know we haven't even really talked about Stephen Hart. The fact they haven't have really had their their head coach here. Uh, obviously, no disrespect to to Mesut Mert, who stepped in and done a great job. But you know, there's there's just something missing with this team. And Wanderers Grounds will help that too, right? You know, we're talking to players around here. That's that's obviously the one ground a lot of people want to get to this year. It's been a long time since even players outside of Halifax have got a chance to play there. It's a special place. And, you know, I think ultimately that's going to make that's going to make a big difference going to make a huge. And also to get some of these players healthy, you know, Peter Shaw, we've barely seen, you know, there's there's an Akeem Garcia really hasn't been fit either. You know, these 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 talisman really need to get going here. And, and when they get back to Halifax, I'm sure they'll be fine. Yeah. Jem Jafar's still to come back as well. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, no one's buried themselves. I mean, we'll, you know, I do think that yeah. it's not like, you know, there's there's no way back here with the 14 playoff. If it was just top two, we we sitting here going, this is going to be a monumental ask for them to get back into the final. But I think with the four and with, you know, let's be honest, 20 more games to play. I think, the, the, you know, we should be OK. 
away, thinking that they've got a chance. They do get their games going again this weekend. Halifax against Valor, that is at two o'clock. And I'll say this, we're going to predict the games in a second. I'll say this, every time a team has been pushed against the wall and comes out needing a win so far in the bubble, most of the time they've got one. Valor <laughs> against Halifax seems like it's one-sided, but you never know in this game. And York against Edmonton, boy, oh boy, do York need a win. And they are the two games this week. York versus Edmonton is the come on match of the week at five o'clock Eastern. We'll get the boys to predict then very soon. Before we do that, and before we leave you, we should talk, chat some Canada soccer. The women are underway in the Olympics. Uh, Benedict, you've been all over this this week. Great piece on Christine Sinclair as well. You can read that at campiel.ca as she obviously got to 300 appearances. What a remarkable achievement and capped it off with a big, a big goal as well. In a game, Benedict, they should have won against the hosts, the Olympic hosts in Japan. Uh, they did not win it in, 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 in all, but they should have won the game. But overall, your impressions on this as they head towards playing Chile this weekend? I think Benedict is still there. I'm not sure. Is he there? May have lost Benedict at that one. <laughs> oh, no, he's back. Yeah, Benedict. What, yeah, what were you? Sorry, I thought you'd fallen asleep, mate. Um, what, were your, <laughs> what were your overall thoughts in this one? Uh, yeah, Canada, the better team for 85 minutes, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, they they did concede. A, I thought it was a really good goal. Uh, people said that Kayla and Sheridan might have wanted that one back, but I thought the strike from Mana Ubuchi was sensational. The, to hit it hit it early on on, on the volley as well. Uh, but for the, for the, most of that game, Canada was the better team. I, I think, especially defensively, they were just turning away everything in sight. They were very good. Um, a disappointment, but I suppose one point in a in a in a system where eight get out of, of 12, one point against Japan is not a disappointment in too much in regards of beat Chile, which you'd expect them to beat Chile and then you know, get four points. You should be okay here, Benedict. Yeah, Chile will be tough. As Beth Friesman has said, uh, they're one of the better goalkeepers in the world with uh, Christiane Endler, I think her name is, from Olympic Lyonnais. Uh, so that will be a tough game, but Canada are expected to come on top on that one and then Great Britain on Tuesday, I believe. So uh, they could pick up you know, four to six points over the next couple of games and that's expectation I think and and they could they could win this group or or finishing third should be enough to get them in if they have four points so um second round is, is obviously the expectation and uh same thing they should get there two massive games coming up for them and Benedict will be all over that at campiel.ca Chile are tough by the way as you said Great Britain who are a good team only beat them by two goals still as well so this will not be a cakewalk for them as for the men Sunday 7 o'clock live on one soccer take on Costa Rica in the quarterfinals Charlie you're all over this for us uh, previewing it uh, this feels like a team that since we've last spoke um have become significant underdogs, should we say. And I think they will enjoy that. Iowa Canola's out for the season. Uh, Kyle Lahren is gone. No Jonathan David, no Alfonso Davies. Uh, Costa Rica, though, are not without their own problems, Charlie, coming into this game as well. But this should be really fun. This is a game we've been waiting for a while to play. Canada having a big game against a big team in this region. Uh, Sunday at 7. This is what, what are you looking forward to the most about this one? Yeah, this is... I, I, I think... I think this tournament has very quickly just become Tejan Buchanan's tournament mm -hmm. and Canada may well in this game sink or swim with, I mean, it's a lot of pressure to put on a very young player who only has just started playing for this national team, but uh, they, they might sink or swim based on, on his performance in this game, especially if he is, you know, put into a more attacking role with, you know, almost every striker now injured. <laughs> um, it'll be it'll be a fun game costa rica is a very good team they're you know a very hard team to play against they love their shenanigans <laughs> um, so yeah this is the kind of test canada wants uh there this is probably the heaviest underdogs they've been in a while and you know it's it's a team that they're going to see again in the fall or the winter i can't remember when exactly they play costa rica but it's a tough, it's a tough game. I'm not gonna lie, but uh, it'll be very fun just to see, you know, how competitive they are in this game. We will recap that on Monday's podcast, and I think we're gonna have a little bit of fun uh, on Monday's podcast. Maybe we'll do a little bit of a quiz, boys. What do you think? A little bubble recap, 32 games in the CPL quiz. You guys up for that? I might team you up, Boy. and uh, okay, yeah, a little, a little fun Let's do for it. that. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. You guys, all, <laughs> Marty, you you okay with that? 
Yeah, if I can remember everything that's happened here, which I don't think I'll be. Hey, look, Absolutely look, not. You're, you're, you're the one person who's got the reasons more than anybody else to not remember anything. You, you know, you've been there in your own mind five years, so it's totally fine. I, I completely, <laughs> completely understand it. And if you have to, you know, step out and get some hot pockets or something during the quiz, we'll, we'll let you do that as well. Uh, but at that point, you'll be able, you'll, you'll be free at that point, Marty. You'll be free yeah. after the games to go to actually go outside. Yeah, I think bubble bubble burst on Saturday night, and I'm planning to go for a big walk around Winnipeg for about probably about two hours. Big walk, That'd be nice. Big walk, a huge wow. walk. I just need to walk. I just be need careful, to go for a walk. Mate. You know, don't go don't go too <laughs> don't go too far. You know, don't, I won't. Yeah, you know, I won't. Big, a big walk that should be fun. All right, let's wrap it up. Uh, predict uh, predict the games this weekend. A reminder: canpl.ca forward slash predictor, where you can go on and predict the games and win points and win trips and prizes, including one to the finals come the end of the season. Halifax Valor, I've already told you, Halifax can win this game. Why not? Let's do it. Charlie, what do you think? Oh, I don't, I don't like you coming to me first because I was going to say no. That's fine. <laughs> That's what you're there for. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to say a will score. Maybe even take the lead early, but I'll say 2-1 Valor. Okay. But Brady? I like a positive result, but maybe not a win. I'll go 1-1. One, one. Okay. Uh, Benedict? I'll, I'll go full chaos. I'll say 1-0 to help I love it. Well, that'll keep you awake, won't it? Even though you're up at like what? By the way, are you going to bed before three thirty a.m. Uh, Saturday, Benedict? Or are you staying up? Nope. Gonna stay <laughs> up. Uh, I'm trying to get trying to get nap this afternoon, and then I'll uh, make some coffee around like eleven or twelve, and, and try to keep stay up till well, it's uh, tonight, so isn't it? Yeah. All right. Everyone, call Benedict at three a.m. Make sure he's awake. Uh, Marty, what about you? You don't need to do that, by the way. You, you're doing enough. Uh. I gotta say, all the crowd the crowds are getting bigger here at Winnipeg, obviously as, as double vaccinations ramp up. I'm gonna say it's gonna be a big crowd and then two nil valor. Also reminds me I've got to return that red card that I showed on the pod the other week. I'm gonna give it yes. back to the fan. There you go. Okay. Uh, we actually got a red card. Uh well yes, we did. One but one Ben McKendry red card. That's what referee messaged me this week, and that is quite astonishing. One red card through thirty games in the ZPL. Or in Benedict's world, zero red cards mm-hmm. so far in the Canadian <laughs> Premier League. FC Edmonton versus York to wrap it up on the come on match of the week. This is gonna be a big game as well for both teams as they end their bubble as well. Uh Marty, you got a prediction for us? Uh I'm gonna say one one. I think I think they can I think they both have goals in them, but I don't think there's much separating. Brady, I think you're our correspondent on this game, are you not? What are you gonna go for here? Yeah, I like this, you know, I'm buying into this backs against the wall thing. I like the York result here. I'm gonna go two one York. Jolly. Uh let's go let's go three nil York. Oh wow. <laughs> York, love it. Whatever. Love it. Benedict, I highly doubt that. Benedict, <laughs> final final word for you. What, what could it be? I, I like the 2 1 York as well, but I do think Easton Garo is going to stay hot and, and find another goal. Interesting. I am doing this game for one soccer, and I've got a feature in the uh, opening pre match broadcast on Easton Angaro and his struggles and breaking down a few plays as well. So, looking forward to talking about that. But I'm like you. When one goal comes like that, very often they will follow. Uh, big week ahead. We will have the podcast on set on Monday, as we'll do a little bit of a fun recap of the bubble in Winnipeg. Uh, Team of the Week will be announced on Monday as well. And I know uh, Charlie will be working on a story on Athletic Atletico Ottawa's return home and the fun things that are going to be going around that game as the schedule starts to open up Um, more stuff coming out next week we'll look forward to that for now enjoy the games everybody and thanks for listening